was really amazing how um <laughs> just in case. <laughs> <laughs> how from <laughs> How, you, how um, my own spirit actually changed your life oh, in a way. way. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm specifically, obviously, my research is um, about water. So for you, you know, you explained how water helped you. Mm -hmm. Caroline, did you, did any of the, the things that I kind of talked about that the women were saying to me using water, did any of it resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. Like. Um, every single thing you had up there was just amazing. I just want to thank you for putting that together because for me, I had my daughter three years ago, um, a water bee bag, and I looked everywhere for yeah. information to support my decision and to know that the trust I had that I could do it, I could see someone else out there also doing it and I didn't have it. Yeah. So it's such a blessing you doing what you're doing. Yeah. that a woman can now reach out and find this information and know that we can do it and there's yeah. a pathway there. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, definitely with the water, it was um, every single thing the woman mentioned resonated with me. Mm. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it was amazing how the women um, actually found the water and the space gave them that control. They felt that it gave them control and protection. Yeah. Yeah. And made them feel more powerful and empowered. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. being in the birthing pool, um, like Annalisa was also um, on all fours. Yeah, it was really such a private space, despite the fact you're not in your home or a space that you know or feel really you know, comfortable in. Mm. It becomes a space that you can really internalize and um, connect with your body and just allow the process to happen. Yeah, a lot of women talk about getting into that zone. Yeah. And that that space allows them to get into that zone. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And in that space, you know, even your, I had a private midwife, even that, the which was amazing and loved having that experience. Um, but yeah, still, I still had that space from everyone mm. around me. Yeah, to just let my body do its thing. Mm. Yeah. Did you, um, during both of your labors actually, did you have any, because um, some women talk about um, like the health, some health professionals feeling as though they need to come into the birth space to reiterate the um, the risks mm. of having a be back and using water. Did either of you experience that? I didn't. No. You didn't? No. Um, I suppose it was probably thank you because um, we'd come up with such a, um, a plan, I yeah. suppose, during the pregnancy. You know, it was actually, as I said, one of the senior consultants actually hand wrote a page in my pregnancy health record of you know, the things that we'd agreed on and mm. the, the negotiation process and what he was okay with. And I suppose because he is in such a senior position, mm. um, it, I suppose a lot of the doctors who were there on the day probably sort of felt, well, we can't really go above and over and above him, yeah. you know, and the plan that he put in place, which I suppose was a blessing. Um, but it was certainly something that we had to, you know, we did have to fight for. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah a lot of the women talk about um, um, the consultation um, at around about 24 weeks where they discuss their options and choices. They found that quite challenging mm -hmm. um, and felt that they needed to prepare for that consultation. Mm -hmm. So that they had a counter um, yeah. argument. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not all the time, but you know, for some women it was very challenging. Mm. Yeah. And I was saying as well, you know, the, the mixed messages between the doctors can be very challenging as well. Mm. When you, you know, for the very first doctor I met at about 24 weeks said, no, nah, we shouldn't be supporting this at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then the senior consultant I met with a couple of times who was, yeah, surprisingly supportive. Um, and then the last doctor, you know, the last visit was, 
you know, sort of took his own stance on the whole thing. So, you know, and as I say, that's as a health professional with all of that knowledge and information ingrained in me, mm -hmm. um, you know, so for women who, you know, are already sort of on the back foot a little bit, mm -hmm. it must be really difficult. So mm -hmm. certainly something that I'm very passionate about changing in my line of work in the antenatal services up here. Mm -hmm. Do you think you know, it's the language they use? You know, but, or do you, do you feel, I mean, I know you're only talking from your own experience, mm -hmm. but what is the issue with it? Is it because they're not giving a balance? It's absolutely unbalanced. Or, yeah, absolutely unbalanced. They focus on the risks associated with VBAC rather mm -hmm. than the benefits associated with everything else. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me, does yeah. the Gold Coast University um, have more good policy? Yes, they do. Yep, yep, they absolutely do. With regards to criteria? Uh, so for women, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Bethan, but I believe it states that there is limited evidence yeah. um, regarding VBAC in the water. The that's residency. it. The that's residency. all it says. Yep, that's all it says. So, so you it doesn't have say. A, a cut off on BMI because that's where it's with that. It no longer does have a cut off for BMI. It's basically if the women are physically able to get in and out of the bath. And that means you, if you've had a cesarean, it's okay. They've um, taken, you know, a VBAC to Arnold out to you. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. So that was a good policy to have. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, I mean, if you actually look at um, Queensland cl clinical guidelines, they actually don't actually support or not support mm. water immersion for VBAC. Mm. Yeah. yeah. They actually mention it, but they don't say either way. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's because there is that lack of evidence that yeah. they, yeah. they can't back it up either way. Yeah. And, 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 that one, and that work instruction for Gold Coast is the same. Mm. It's within that work instruction, it's neither supported nor not supported. Mm. Um, mm. Because it, back to the whole topic, is that thing that, you know, there are people who would have it unsupported and people who would have it supported. So it currently there's room for supporting feedback within our policies and guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, but it actually, it, yeah, I suppose it is a little bit ambiguous either way. <laughs> um, but it doesn't um, say that you can't, it, you're not supported. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, does that, I mean, that's wonderful that there's room for negotiation, but I do see yeah. that could be a positive and a negative. It is. So that it could be, as this happens, the doctor could argue either way, which leads a woman who's asking for support. What it does say, though, is for a woman who has had a previous cesarean section, that there is a requirement for her to be continuously monitored. And that's, to be honest, whether she's in the water or not. Yeah. Um, uh, it is one of the things that is, um, it sits uncomfortable with yeah. some of our medical colleagues, if a woman isn't monitored. Mm. Um, it can be monitoring the water? The midwife, yeah. yeah. as you can. said before, the midwife's yeah. monitoring all the time, so yes. there's yeah. no need is to have the electronics. Is that in line with the layers of research in terms of monitoring? Because there's just been some research coming out now to say that it can be more dangerous to have continuous monitoring. But yeah. so I'm not sure if that's for not for VIVA. Not for VIVA, not, yeah, not it says not, not for high risk. Um, do you want to talk about Sorry, in my experience, I um, was a, I suppose, a case where I declined continuous monitoring. Mm -hmm. And that was challenging mm -hmm. for me. Um, I um, came up with a lot of feelings that were um, these things that you mentioned in yeah. your slideshow mm -hmm. that I was putting my child's life at risk, my own health at risk. But I knew, for me, was my choice that that was how I would like to birth my child in the water. Um, I did understand that from a professional point of view, that was the guidelines they had to follow. And in particular, one health professional, she decided to not see me through. Like if I was to come in on that day, yeah. she said that I won't take you because I followed these guidelines, which was fair enough and I understood that. But then we did find another one who would welcome me in that position. Um, so it was challenging, but it, I did it. <laughs> I did it without a cannula, without any monitoring at all. I, at the very end, just before I birthed my baby, um, 
page asked for me to be checked, check my cervix, which I was being dilated. At that point already, I knew I was about to birth my baby, but they were there asking, so I said, sure. And she, as she checked, she was like, yes, yeah, she's coming right now. I'm sorry, <laughs> like literally. <laughs> so, um, and Karen, but it gave me that touch to be in tune because I had that space in the water. Yeah. And Did you know from the beginning of, because I'm sure it's a journey once you had a cesarean, you fall pregnant again, hmm. as you stepped out, Beth, and there's this process of reclaiming, reclaiming mm -hmm. the birth. <laughs> Did you know from the beginning you didn't, you didn't want monitoring, or was that something that you came to later? Well, uh, for my first, I, I wanted a home birth in the water, <laughs> and uh, I just thought, oh yeah, I'm a woman, I can do this. <laughs> I don't need to prep myself, really. I'll just go to a few yoga classes. <laughs> I did join a beautiful pregnancy group in Byron Bay, and uh, had a private midwife and a doula. But there, I was realised that actually I there are beautiful things you can do to prepare yourself for having a baby um, that you know probably led me down the course of ending up in a cesarean as I did with my first. Um, so yeah, I suppose I just already had that for my first, that I wanted to have a totally natural birth. So to carry it on to the second was quite an easy process for me. It was the, yeah, it was my desire from the beginning and as, with Annalise, I also had my son with me at my birth, my second child's birth. Um, the healing process I felt not just for me, but because I also thought that I failed him and not giving him the entry into the world that he deserved. That every human I believe should have, but you know. Uh, Things happen. <laughs> I can't blame myself for it. Um, it's not healthy. <laughs> um, so it was a gift that I gave him to, you know, and teaching him as well and myself. I didn't know I could do that myself. Like, be a strong person and what I believe in and follow through and uh, have a baby as I wanted it, even though I had a lot of things around me saying you can't do it. Yeah, that's quite common um, of the women that I uh, interview. Mm. Some of them actually, when they actually gave birth, they had this amazing disbelief that they'd done it yeah. because they had this nagging doubt in the back of their mind that it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. yeah. We, we tend to suppress the instinctiveness of the woman yeah. and we don't often hear what she's saying because of the busy way we work in mm. a systemisation uh, practice, you know, we're, we're so busy and we're not listening mm. and then when we're not listening we're actually not looking and seeing either. Mm. So when we learn to use those skills I think it makes a huge difference. Mm. But you know, women have been birthing in the sea with the dolphins for ye hundreds of years. Mm. Mm. So. Um, I think we just need to start turning the clock back and I think we're on the pathway. Mm. Just make it happen before I die, please. <laughs> <laughs> and Caroline, how did you prepare? How did you get around those doubts? That you uh, I did hypnobirthing. Yay. Yeah, I did hypnobirthing from pretty much as soon as I found out I was pregnant. Good. Um, actually, after my first, when my baby, you know, after I had my caesarean, my midwife said, you should do hypnobirthing. <laughs> I was okay. So I held on to that and I took her wisdom and I did hypnobirthing and uh, that, yeah, was amazing. And I really, really pushed, like, it was every day meditating, positive mm -hmm. affirmations, trusting my body. Beautiful. Yeah. Is there anything else you would do on top? Is there something else that you thought of afterwards? Oh, if, if I'd done this or that, maybe this could have been even easier? Is there anything else you would recommend for anyone thinking about a VBAC? Um, well, I suppose like when you have your, your first, of course, you have your journey, um, revisiting my first was important mm -hmm. to go back there and, and, you know, break down what happened and be at peace with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I think... I don't know, I think the hypnobirthing is, it sort of creates, it's a, 
it's a bigger than just the birthing process. You know, it's like, yeah, for your whole prepares you for so much more. I think the hypnobirthing. So yeah, mm -hmm. physically, of course, you can do a lot of things. Um, chiropractic work helped me, <laughs> but that was just in my journey. So I had <coughs> broken, pretty much fractured tailbone in the first. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could do hypno midwifing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see what you do. But we do. Oh. Yeah, there are a lot of midwives who are not hypno birthers, but they still do hypnobirthing. Good. <laughs> I'm glad to know. All midwives who are. But I'm picking all midwives that are going to be with a woman. If they've got that that same connection mm -hmm. through what they do, it would be a pathway that would mm. probably see some more changes. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a great hypno birthing. <laughs> advocate sorry but, oh, okay. you know, um, only through seeing women get so focused that it has to be that way rather than going into the birth and just allowing what needs to move at the time and that's where you've got your support whether it's your midwife or a drill or a question yeah, Mama, I just don't want her to be frozen because she's wrestling with. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you have questions. Oh, Do you want yeah. to ask it now or later? Oh, I was just going to say, like, I've, I've had a VBAC as well um, here, and I'm also a midwife. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm pregnant with my third. So I'm in a very different perspective. So I had my VBAC here at Gold Coast from the Redlands because we have no options there. We have two normal baths. So last time, because I had a fantastic private midwife, I had the opportunity of coming as a private woman to the Gold Coast. And now this time I have no option because I'm still a, technically a VBAC. Yeah. Um, I can't come to Gold Coast. There's physically no facilities to support um, the water birth in Metro South at all. So Bo Desert, Logan and Redlands. Um, so it's really hard. So it's really important as a woman and as a midwife that we do this research to me because, um, you know, I've been advocating at Redlands as a midwife mm -hmm. and as a woman, um, collecting surveys to petition for birth force. They're going to come, but it's going to come after this one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just think, you know, in this area we're really lucky that, that, that women can come and they can have that voice and stand for it and say, well, I want it. Um, and I accept the risk, but in some areas it's just, and this is a, a Brisbane area, you know, it's it's not, it's not available um, at all. It's not even an option. Not even an option. So, you know, uh, yes, I could go down the private, private path, but, you know, I'm putting any private midwife at risk of caring for all women at home as a VBAC is not something that's supported. So, you know, this one I just plan to labour at home as long as I can and then go into the hospital, but it means that I can't have yeah. the birth that I want. I can't come to Gold Coast because you no longer accept our okay. area, which is understandable. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I just think that research is so important and yeah. is there capacity now to move this to to that, to that quantitative side to, to give it the numbers and the power because I know that Gold Coast is very, you know, um, revolutionary um, but yeah, other health services we know aren't and um, and there's big challenges ahead to to get there depending on who's in at the time and what's Come and join us as a PhD candidate. I mean, <laughs> you're no, I travel in Australia next year with these other <laughs> ones so, uh, so I won't be <laughs> but I, yeah, there's lots of women that want it the amount of surveys we collected at Redlands to them and want it, but yeah. it's just, yeah, it gets blocked. Are there any private practice oh. midwives around the area? Yeah, there is, and there are some that do you, but like it puts, really, I believe it puts, you know, in, them in a precarious position, t caring for a technical VBAC, VBAC woman, you know, I just don't think it's not in the timelines. Bring your pill to my place. <laughs> 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 I'm I'm very bring bring the midwife, yeah. and I'll just be her buddy. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> big midwife myself, and um, so, I'm in a very different position this pregnancy because I've got a few years, mm -hmm. four years. And Annalise, under all we graduated at the same time, um, under my belt, then, you know, the first when I had Ryan, cheeky Ryan, um, I was two weeks away from graduating when I had him. And for me, that experience resonates completely as a woman. Like, I, the whole time, I don't know how many times my midwife and my good friend Chris next to me here, it's also a midwife, listened to me say, so maybe it was my pelvis last time, maybe it was this, and it is a journey whether you're a woman, a midwife, or whatever you are. Um, and my appointment, at the Gold Coast, the doctor was, you know, 
I'll give you 50-50, she said. Wow. I'll give you 50-50. And I, I did want to go back and find that person and say, well, you yeah. know, here's your 50, love, because <laughs> he came out and he was an equal killer baby as well. Yeah. So, but without this service, that yeah. second time and my midwife wouldn't have happened. So yeah. I think, you know, very important we do research to back Do you up. think the water actually helped? Oh, definitely. You achieve your feedback in that instant? Definitely. One, number one, I give to Melinda, my midwife, because, you know, without her and her model of care and how hard the private practice midwives work, mm -hmm. despite how many challenges they face, um, I wouldn't have had an option. And, you know, I was in my third year of university at Griffith and spent a whole year reflecting on, before I was even pregnant, mm -hmm. what happened last time, why I didn't... Why didn't it work out? And then to go through, you know, um, then it was, you know, was it my body? And then going through that journey. And that was having knowledge. Like, like Annalise says, you know, like, yes, we might be midwives, mm. but we're women as well. And, you know, it's, it's both journey, isn't it? And yeah, I think if I didn't have the model of care, but the water, um, my, my husband is a truck driver. And we were driving out of the hospital for that early discharge. And he said to me, he turned to me unprompted and said, I don't get it. Isn't it just water? You couldn't have done it without the water. <coughs> My truck driving husband said that to me. <laughs> yeah. And wow. I said, never really has much perspective on these things. And, and even he, he got he got it. Yeah. He was like, I had an epidural the first time. Persistent ROP, physician baby, this one in labour, like on the right, up against my back. Um, my cervix swelled, he was asynclitic, he did everything he shouldn't have done and he took 12 hours from six centimetres and I make everybody work really hard. But, you know, I got there, I got there because I had a good bottle of care and I had a nice protective, it did feel protective to me, that space. Um, and yeah, I couldn't have done it without it. So yeah. it is very different for me, this pregnancy, thinking, well, last time that was water, I needed that. Yeah. And, and not having that option as a woman and all that with free brain as well and knowing, yeah. Mm. I'm, just, oh, I'm just interested in when did you girls, women, sorry, when did you women get in the water, into the pool? At what stage in your labour did you get in and stay the whole time? Did you get in, did you get out, did you wait till you felt like pushing, which is what so many hospitals sort of recommend? Um, okay, for, for me, um, uh, I live... I lived at the time at Cabrita Beach, which is like 20 minutes south of the border. <laughs> so I chose the uni because um, I don't think they had that zone going on then. <laughs> so I could come here and know that I could have a bee back in the water, which was great. Um, my second, my I because I naturally started my birth with my first, my second came on really fast. Um, actually, I didn't even really know I was in labour because I was pretty much hit my you know, uh, affirming all day. Um, when I got to the hospital, I took like an hour or whatever to get here. Um, I pretty much felt like she was ready to come out already. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't having monitoring, I'm not actually too sure. I just jumped in straight away. Yeah, so you basically arrived in uh, arrived. active labour, if you want to call yeah. that. And just Absolutely. Yeah. Jumped in straight away and then um, got out to use the toilet and came back in and then she was born. Um, yeah. But that process took probably three to four hours. Which is quick. Yeah. Mm. Um, <coughs> yeah. But yeah, I couldn't wait to get like couldn't wait to get in the water too. Yeah. That walking through when you're in an active labour too, yeah. walking through the bright lights and everything, and yeah. going through contractions, walking along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't wait to get. It. <laughs> it's like ah. Oh. <laughs> I just ask you about yeah. the yeah. moment. So uh -huh. You and I. Oh yeah. I planned a home water birth for my first minute of an emergency C set. Uh -huh. As the surgeon, the female surgeon was stitching me up, she told me you can have a big back for your next one, which I thought was amazing at the time. Yeah. But like, please just let me know if it's stable. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've done can birth for this one. Oh great. Um plan on doing a water birth, like big back here. But my battle is seven degrees they had a big cannula. I was so dehydrated the last time it took me about 45 minutes to get one in. Mm -hmm. So I've agreed to that, but our current battle will be continuous monitoring. Uh -huh. So I have a private midwife who's advocating for me, but we have another appointment at 36 weeks, and that's going to be like 
this is what I want and this is what I don't mm -hmm. want you. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know, like, did you just like just stick to your guns and they accepted it with you going into the water, or did you have to still negotiate on the day? Yeah, well, um, in my consultations prior to, now um, because I had a private midwife, I stalled all my. We were supposed to go in at 24 weeks. I think I think my first visit was at like 34 weeks because I knew that I would come up against pressure that I didn't want to deal with. So um, yeah, I pretty much stuck to my guns. I mean, at the end of the day, it's your body, yeah. choice. it's your choice, and you will feel pressure, and that's really hard. I once walked away, felt like I'd been bullied, was like crying and so emotional because I was just wanting something for myself, but. It's just told that you know, no, 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 you can't do this. I mean, I'm sure you know how it feels. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, surprisingly, I've had I've been prepared for that. Oh, good. It hasn't happened. Well, there's good. a couple of appointments that I've like I had the run on ready to go, and they've just gone, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that's great. So Thank I'm hoping you. that the next appointment will yeah. be okay. But my my midwife has warned me that I may on the day say you're putting your baby's life at risk. Yeah, well, actually, on the day I, I because I had a private midwife, I just talked to her. I didn't actually speak to anybody else. Okay. I was just zoned in with her, and she mm -hmm. would communicate with the um, health professionals, and then communicate with me. Yeah. And then she would always communicate my wishes because she knew what they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got to the three-hour mark, I think that's when they wanted to do an um, observation internal. Mm -hmm. But other than that, mm -hmm. they were actually really great. Like they just let us do our own thing. I think at this point it would be great to hear from Kirsten yeah. about <coughs> monitoring. Oh. Kirsten is an obstetrician and has <laughs> yeah. yeah. PhD is about being yes, <laughs> 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 I think I was going to ask uh, only that despite the or the, you know, there is as you said, there's lack of evidence supporting benefits of water erosion um, for feedback. In, in labour and birth, but what are we up against in terms of the challenges or the barriers we're facing from other health professionals about? What is it about that we, if, if we say it's only water after all? Why, why, why are there resistance? There's, there's three barriers. The first is that the position of comfort for obstetricians is we'd rather have you have a caesarean section. So first of all, you have to um, convince the reluctant that vaginas are awesome. And <laughs> There's, the second one is around the issue of fetal monitoring um, because that will limit your choices and it will increase the chances that you will have another caesarean section. Um, so there are challenging decisions to be made about whether you're going to opt in for continuous fetal monitoring or not. And then the water boots really is just the last of those and it intersects with the fetal monitoring issue because of the challenges around doing continuous fetal monitoring in the bucket. Which is, is that, not is necessarily available in all places. Is that a policy to have continuous fetal monitoring? For all women having fetal yeah. monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so did yours have, sorry, yeah. was yours have yeah. water? Because yeah. like, I saw yours. So they have, in Gold Coast, do they have? They do have wireless waterproof mm -hmm. wireless wires. Water. Yeah. Yeah. Wireless water, or is that? Yeah. 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 Okay. We, we have right. some. Telemetry. We have some That's telemetry that. equipment that goes missing on a regular basis. <laughs> 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 which is not being replaced because the models are not being made anymore. Good. Um, and it's, it, um, there's often interference when there's movement and when there's water making contact with it, so you don't necessarily get a good quality of tracing. And because it's telemetry and they're battery operated, the batteries run flat. So it's not necessarily the solution to that particular issue. What I do want to come back to is the evidence base around CTG monitoring. We don't know what the evidence is. They just think that they do, okay? Mm. So the majority of the research that's been done about fetal monitoring, full stop, regardless of whether we're talking about VBAC or not, was done between 1976 and 1996. <laughs> do you remember what the seizure rate was during those years? Okay, it was a 15% or less. And it was also the once a caesarean, always a caesarean era. So the women that were being recruited into research trials, almost certainly I can guarantee you that none of them were labouring with a previous caesarean scar. Mm -hmm. And if they were, it's not identified in the research because I've specifically gone looking for it and you cannot tell when you look at the research whether it includes any women having a VBAC. Okay, so the bulk of the evidence that we've got appears to exclude that group 
of women mm -hmm. from the research. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we have no good research. The exception to that is a trial that was done in India in 2006, and they had 50 women in each arm, all of whom had had one previous caesarean section and were having a, a plain vaginal birth, and 50 were having continuous CTG monitoring and 50 were having intermittent auscultation. It was therefore underpowered to be able to detect any differences. Yeah. It didn't find a difference in perinatal outcomes. It, there was a higher seizure rate amongst those who had the monitoring, but it didn't reach statistical significance, but possibly only because the sample size was small. Mm -hmm. So we have no evidence to say that your baby will be better off if you have CTG monitoring. We also have no evidence to say that it is safe not to have CTG monitoring. Okay, so it's important that we're clear on that. So, don't, so if an obstetrician or a midwife says to you, you have to have this because the evidence is really clear that it improves outcomes, ask them for that evidence. Mm -hmm. yes. Can I throw in the mix age as well? Because I'm over 40, and so it's very, <laughs> very personal question. If you throw the age into the monitoring, would, would the age be a concern? Like, would you go to the monitoring, monitoring you know, if, if recommendation? You, if, you are, if you're over 42, regardless, and you haven't had a previous caesarean section, the recommendation would be that you have continuous monitoring. Again, that's not because there's evidence that, that monitoring improves the outcomes. We do have evidence that stillbirth is more common amongst older women, and the assumption is that CTGs will fix that, but there is actually no evidence that says that that's the case. Thank you. So a couple, of, a couple of thoughts from stuff that's come up is that don't forget that as the pregnant woman that you actually are the one who has most power in this situation. As a, a, a registered health practitioner, in order for me to maintain my registration, I need to follow the guidelines of my profession. And so Ranscog has a whole bunch of guidelines that say, I have to recommend to you that you have a caesarean section. I have to recommend to you that you have continuous fetal monitoring. I have to inform you of the fact that there is no evidence to support the use of water in labour. I don't have a choice about that if I wish to maintain my registration. If I'm then employed by a health service or I have signed an agreement with a health service so that I can access it as a private practitioner, then I agree that I will abide by the policies of that hospital. And so I don't have a choice about that. You, as a consumer, you don't sign any agreement that says, I agree to abide by the rules of this organisation. Mm, just don't sign. They can't sack you. Mm. <laughs> they can't deregister you. They might curl the top lip and have a hissy fit and storm out. <laughs> and they, and, if, and if, you know, if you get somebody bad, they may be abusive towards you, which means you can then report them to APRA. <laughs> So you don't have to agree to have a consultation with a doctor at the hospital if you're no. planning a VBAC. Yeah, of course. It's not compulsory. And nor should it be. It's your vagina. That's right. You don't need anybody else's permission to make use of it. <laughs> no, it's different. You're having a cesarean section where you want an induction and you want the doctors to do something for you, then yes, you need to have a consultation and a conversation. But what you're asking them to do is to do nothing. <laughs> you don't need their permission. No, that. you do not. Okay. If it would be useful for you to have that information and you don't feel like you've got enough information to make the decision, then obviously a consultation with a health practitioner who does have the knowledge is useful. But you know, midwives are perfectly qualified to give that information to you. It doesn't have to be an obstetrician. The midwife, again, APRA registered. It's under the consultation and referral guidelines. They do have to recommend to you that you have that consultation. They cannot force you to have it. See, I find that funny. And like you said, they can't force you. It does come across yeah. being a young mother myself and also just starting a bit of a course. Like I, it comes across not as a recommendation. Mm -hmm. It comes across as Law. You know, like that's so a Show me the law. Happen. Show me the law. Yeah, and, and that's that's why as clinicians we need to be really careful with our language. I had so many aha moments. It's like it's actually my second second pregnancy. I had I went through the midwifery birthing center here as well and going through this um, second time and I still find difficulty with the language mm -hmm. in both sides. Mm -hmm. And I did have some Already two moments, I was like, "Oh, it's just a recommendation." I thought it was law, 
and coming from both sides. Yes. So it, it is, and she's actually starting to study, so it, yes. you might change, <laughs> your generation might start changing that then. Yeah. If you get coming across as law, you say, okay, the same to them. I hear that you're making a recommendation for me. I thank you for your advice. I'll let you know when I've made my decision. Yeah. Yes. And also it's hard well done. Multiple different people, you see every single time. You have and that's yeah. why that's why the choice of your care provider yeah. is the Fair. most mm -hmm. important thing. Mm -hmm. You need to have continuity of midwifery care, Absolutely. not just for VBAC, but for any woman that's pregnant. The evidence is astonishingly clear. It's the only research-based effective tool that we have that prevents stillbirth. Yeah. Are you being told that? Mm. No, no. no. It's, CTGs yeah. don't prevent stillbirth. Midwifery led continuity care prevents stillbirth. So, which one of those two things would you like to have at your feedback? So, maybe <laughs> the experienced <laughs> people should compile a list of things for women to have so that. We, it's ready and waiting the for them. A list yeah. of things that, that, that you're already just telling us and we all, some of us are aware of, but that list should be available for every woman to save her the time and the effort of having to try and go find the information. <coughs> we should be compiling that. To because when I was pregnant with my first, I had my first two babies I had a compile, so it's a compile that was sent up. And, um, I had to ask my GP both times for a referral to my private care. Because the first question I got, do you have private health care? Yeah. My answer is yes, but I'm not covered for obstetrics, so I have it, but I don't. Yeah. Um, and I found the birth centre myself. But, you know, you kind of then are let off. But it's like, and I know a lot of stuff is put on GPs and they are in a very hard position. But, you know, most people that I knew had birth with an obstetrician. They had birth with a midwife. Yeah. So you can, you can self-refer either to a private yeah. midwife or into an And I ended up doing that. But, you know, mm. it makes it really hard when you feel like you're not getting that information too. Like, I agree, I think we really need to be talking more when women are planning a fall in the pregnant and saying, hey, this is the evidence. And, you know, it's so refreshing to hear saying we don't have that evidence, that evidence about the monitoring. It would be wonderful if every obstetrician could yeah. say that and hear that. Did you know? And then open the little book yeah, and put it to the person. It's so refreshing to hear that. Thank you. It's very difficult. I have to say, as a, as a midwife, and there's a continuity of care midwife, what's resonated with me is the conversations that are happening out. You know, you talked about the conversations that are happening outside in the corridor. Mm -hmm. And it is really difficult, I have to say, honestly, it's really difficult to support a woman who wants a VBAC, VBAC mm -hmm. because often we are the ones that are advocating, and those conversations come at our door first. Mm -hmm. And they make it really difficult for us to tread that corridor yeah. comfortably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are. Like in my experience, I'm not saying that this is of all, but they are waiting at the door. In fact, they're actually, as you said, coming through the curtains mm -hmm. and trying to, you come out here and we'll talk to you about. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it is really um, difficult. So that part takes the uh, midwife away from the yeah. woman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A lot yeah. of the women in my study said that, you know, one woman said that, you know, I think I put one, one of her quotes up there. She felt as if they were outside waiting to pounce on her. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, they did. Yeah. They did, and they did pounce on me to the point that mm -hmm. I had to sit with a room full of solicitors wow. to prove that I didn't yeah. actually do the things that they said that I did. Wow. So, yeah. they do. That's a great point for mothers and consumers to take on, to really take in, that the carers that are attending to you can't necessarily advocate for what you want because they're under so much stress and to not to lose their jobs, fear of litigation, insurance, unions, and there's so much going on for them. It's not that they don't want to support your health care, it's actually very difficult for them to say, even wording the right way to word it, to, to, that you can get away with giving the right advice because it's just not as, um, they just can't do it. So it really is up to the consumer to do as much research as they can, to have as many tools as they ha can in their bag to when they are coming to the consultations, if they do have to, if they do want to, to know what to say, to know what to ask for, and to know what to say when you're refused, when you're, when you're refusing the care. You're not you're refusing, refusing, you're declining. 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 So I no, don't like the word refuse. Yeah. 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 Okay, I can I think that's a version of tone releasing. I think yeah. it's all sweetheart, calm down and be a good girl. Yeah. I can 
refuse. What the fuck are they? Like? <laughs> Me. I can yeah. refuse to have people treat me disrespectfully. Absolutely. I can refuse a straw. Yeah. Why, do, why can't I refuse health care? Yeah, that's right. Why do that's I right. have to be polite and kind and nice mm. in order to be treated like a decent human being in a hospital? Yeah. Can I, can I just say, I'm, I'm supporting um, two women this weekend. Um, one's actually ruptured. She's at home. She's been trying, the hospital's trying to force her to go into hospital because apparently she has indicators for cholestasis, which is fine, but she's only having two indicators at the moment. Um, so she's flat out refusing to just go in because they can't give her a diagnosis. Um, so she's happy to labour at home, that's fine. <coughs> My other lady is post-dates. Now she's always wanted a water birth. Um, she's now post-dates. She's for 42 weeks tomorrow. Uh -huh. And they've basically said at the Mater Hospital in Brisbane that you cannot have a water birth once you turn 42 weeks because you are then ineligible, for whatever reason. And I said to her, well, you know what, it is your vagina and, you know, you have the choice to birth wherever and however you choose. Um, if they don't want to do that, then they can recuse themselves and leave the birth, that mm. birth space. So she's basically, she wants that, um, but at the same time she's, compromising and going in to have um, augmentation tonight just because she's been hounded by them last minute to have this done. Um, so I've had to do a lot of work with her over the last week to prepare her for these conversations that she's going to have um, and whatnot. But she's still hoping that she can have her water birth, but in saying that she's going in for Proston and most guidelines will basically say, well, you've had Proston, there's, you need to have monitoring, you need to have this, you need to have that, so you can't get in the water. So I've had to help her work through that and be strong enough to say, you know what, I know I've had Proston, but I'm still getting my ass in that water. You know, and, but it shouldn't have to be a fight. She shouldn't have to prepare herself to have that argument. Mm. And prepare her, her partner, and her, and have myself as a doula to be able to do that for her. I'm a VBAC three times over myself, and I know that fight. Mm. You know, just but this is this is a this is a prime if, having to have the fights that I've had as a VBAC. Mm. It's bullshit. Mm. You know, when are we going to change this? Like, Can I just ask one question? Is there a female family history of gestational age? Being different. Being she's what? just a late ovulator. Yeah, mm. so there you go. Yeah. She's she's just. I a, think she put far too much emphasis on that. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Very absolutely. well. Yeah. And, I mean, and they, I've had several women gone to 43 weeks, but you look back at the family history, the maternal history shows 43 week gestation. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Also, the way they count the is totally questionable. The way they yeah. how they count yeah. when they feel yeah. it's the right day, it's just they think. Mm. So you never really know if somebody's it's going over. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. estimated. I'm just aware of time has passed and we want to just pass on a bit of information to each. We're moving into informed decision making in maternity care territory, which is what we which is what we spoke about here last time back in April and we've recorded that session. You can catch it for free at our website if you sign up to our newsletter at pvbmedia.org. You can then cancel the newsletter if you don't want it, but we don't bombard you. We're not bombarders. Um, and it's a wonderful session that will really explain lots around recommendations and uh, policy and where the human, where our human rights actually sit in this whole picture. This here is a slide that is... Um, <coughs> our previous presenter was Dr. Beth Jenkinson <coughs> from UQ and she said we could use these slides that show the things that clinicians can do and then we can do too. And so there's, there's a couple here, but I've also included some of that information in your um, handouts, if you got them, but if you didn't, we can email it to you. There's a one page, what can, what we can do. Um, and yeah, that last one, encourage the woman to document. Um, communicating with colleagues, um, not to focus on the extreme cases, which is a great one. Um, and some further points here that will be of interest here. 
seeing that your documentation and the, the process that you use for negotiating with women is seen as a living document, um, and that it's none of it is set in stone because she can change her mind. Mm -hmm. um, so in one sense, you'd be probably better off to just agree with them when you go in to have your consult and then leave your fight until the end. Because they document that. Thing. Like you say, you've got, like, you've got yeah. to make, you know, it's not anyone's choice and you just have to accept that this is, I hear what you're saying, like I, I, I educate the women that, that I care for and work with, and yeah. anything you decide, whether it's if you want to eat ice in water, like, I understand you're recommending I don't have that and have something else, but this is my decision. I hear what you're saying, mm. but this is my choice, and I'm making an informed choice. Mm. So I, I find I just educate women on informed mm. choice, no matter what it is on the perspective, so that when they're there, it doesn't come back on the onus in that moment of you trying desperately to tell them, do you feel like you're <coughs> all pumps? I say then, if you're not getting that bread, if you're not getting that one piece of the information, this feels like there's something missing, there probably is something missing <laughs> from what you're being told. So if you're being told this is the benefits of what I want you to do, but you're not being told the risks of, mm. if you don't make that decision, then you're not getting the full picture. Mm. And I've had dads that have heavily advocated for mums because they understood that concept antenatally. And you also have to be told the alternatives. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. But I think sadly one of the one of the problems with one of the problems with a lot of the women that I interviewed is that on their first birth they were very naive. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know that they needed to know all of this. No. Mm -hmm. They went in quite trusting mm -hmm. into the healthcare system, thinking that they would get that information yeah. that they needed. Women are so powerful, they just don't realise how powerful mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. Or that you um, that your best interests are at end. And here's some information here about, uh, as a consumer, uh, you can make compliments or complaints. Um, this is for this particular service, but with every health service, there is a form, a web form that you can fill in. And you can also have your say on the design of your health service. So not just your particular situation. You can get involved in the design of your local services. And I really encourage that you do that. I do it and Ali does it. And anyone is able to get involved. And, yeah, my pleasure. And um, there's Patient Opinion Australia. But it's a place, a website where you can go and register your opinion about a particular hospital or doctor. And Choosing Wisely Australia is an organisation that was set up to stop the unnecessary testing of procedures. Mm. This is a national, national organisation, part of an international campaign. And there was a, an article in the news in the Sydney Morning Herald a couple of weeks ago from a doctor <laughs> saying that there's where um, consumers are being over-serviced. Ah. It's the head, um, the head of Australia. Yeah. Forget to think, but he's like at the top. He's at the top of what, um, what is advised to the government around health care. And a whole team of doctors has put together this report that Australians are being over-diagnosed extremely and causing harm. It's really great to actually look that up. It's extremely much so if you go to Choosing Wisely Australia, there are five questions that you can ask your healthcare provider. Um, those are the questions there. Another easy way to think about it is the BRAIN acronym. So B for benefits. What are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? What does my intuition tell me when I, you know, after hearing all of this, what feels right? And what if we do nothing? So that's brain, really helpful in any consultation. Um, two other organisations working a lot in this space. And oh, so that's it. So um, thank you very much to everyone who was willing to come along for this ride. Um, to Kirsten, to Bethan, and to Caroline and Annalise being willing to step up. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And I just would like to hand over to Paula for some closing remarks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.
Um, just to, uh, to concur with what Sally said, a fabulous uh, session this morning, really informative. Thanks, Bethan, for sharing um, where you're up to so far with your PhD, and Kirsten for your uh, knowledge and presence here too, but especially to Annalise and to Caroline for your fabulous stories. Um, and that's where it lies, you know, the power lies with women so, at the end of the day. So I think those um, choices that women make um, and how important they are to have somebody that's going to em help empower you, empower yourself, help empower you to um, make your decisions, to have the knowledge and to advocate for you is really important. Um, <laughs> and to finish with what Sally said as well is, you know, those questions when you're uh, faced with what you think may be a rule, you know, that somebody is uh, delivering something in a way that they're giving you um, maybe one side of the story and not all sides of the story, then one of the good questions to actually address that with is, what if I do nothing? What if I do nothing? What would happen then? And that will actually get you a lot of the answers that you want. Um, and remembering all the time, you know, the powers of women. Midwives, doctors, we are bound by our you know, professional standards, um, about our working policies, instructions, um, and we are here to advocate you, and we're here to advocate you with great knowledge. But the person that we learn most from is from you, is from women. Um, you know, you, you're the main focus of everything that, that we do. Thanks. Can I also add that we need more time with Kirsten? <laughs> <laughs> Much more time with I Kirsten. Well, until the PhD's done. Yeah. <laughs> and it needs to be paid time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come, I'd love to listen. Yes, I think we really do need that. And lastly, can I just say, uh, everybody, please do support PBF, PBB Media. Um, there are opportunities there to listen to the podcast again and all of the other interesting podcasts they do. Um, the number of sessions that I've been to have been absolutely like this one, very informative and, you know, have added to the richness of my knowledge too. Um, so I would actually encourage everybody to be involved and to have a look at the podcast as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.